For greater convenience and portability, spectacle-mounted indirects are also available. The lighter weight is achieved by having fewer core functions, principally light intensity and aperture adjustment. Their portability, however, makes them particularly useful for bedside and domiciliary consultations. Probably one of the most useful practical innovations is the recent development of the cordless instrument. This allows entirely unrestricted mobility of the examiner and does away with troublesome wires and cables that invariably get in the way and can be a safety hazard as well as a distracting nuisance. Now that you understand the basics of how the indirect works and how to best set it up, you're ready to learn the clinical examination techniques that are used for viewing the fundus. It's useful to think of the examination in two stages. Firstly, the preparation of the patient, and secondly, the actual examination of the fundus. Preparation of the patient begins by explaining in full the purpose and nature of the examination. In particular, it helps if you let people know that the light is usually extremely bright and that indentation is always a bit uncomfortable. If you prepare your patients in this way, then there won't be any nasty surprises. With the patient suitably prepared, you're now ready to proceed with a systematic examination of the retina. Begin with the illumination at quite a low level. The lower intensity will reduce patient discomfort and allow the retina to adapt. You can steadily increase the brightness as the patient becomes more accustomed to the light. Start by getting the patient to look in the direction of the area of interest and position yourself diametrically opposite this line of gaze. First, illuminate the fundus without the condensing lens to make sure that you're lined up with the pupil and can see a clear red reflex. Then, position the condensing lens starting close up to the patient's eye. Condensing lenses are generally optically asymmetric and they are intended to be used with the white rim that's on one side of the casing facing towards the patient. You need to keep the patient's pupil, the condensing lens and your illumination beam anchored together along an imaginary straight line. Slowly pull the lens towards you until you begin to get a view of the fundus. For a 20 dart lens this will usually be at about 5 to 10 centimeters or 2 to 4 inches away from the eye. Remember that the image is horizontally and laterally inverted. This takes some while to get familiar with but with continued practice orientation becomes progressively easier. When performing a comprehensive examination of the fundus, most examiners stand at the head of the couch and begin by viewing the inferior retina first. This area is the easiest to indent in terms of both access and patient comfort, which helps to put the patient more at ease. Work your way around the eye, moving your position as needed, together with the patient's head and gaze position, in order to retain an optimal view. Examination of the more sensitive posterior pole should be left until last, finishing off with the optic disc and macula. An alternative to the supine position for examination is to simply have the patient seated on a chair with the examiner seated opposite. Although this is adequate for gross fundal examination, the use of scleral indentation to dynamically examine the extreme retinal periphery is very difficult. Consequently, the assessment of peripheral pathologies such as retinal tears or dialyses, although possible, is somewhat less reliable. Retaining a view of the peripheral retina is a challenge in extremes of gaze because the shape of the pupil that faces the examiner becomes effectively elliptical. Recalling Goulstrand's principle of the three beams of light, this ovalization of the pupil cuts off the illumination beam, resulting in a loss of fundal view. In practice, this can be compensated for to some degree by tilting your head sideways at about 45 degrees. This brings the illumination beam back into the pupil aperture. However, the compromise is that there's usually a loss of stereopsis because now one or two of the observer beams fall outside the pupil aperture. Some newer indirects have variable pupil function described earlier that partially compensates for this pupil ovalization effect. This feature can be very helpful in this situation. Scleral indentation is an important technique for examination of the peripheral retina and one that, although uncomfortable, needn't be too unpleasant for the patient. The two key principles to observe 
are the appropriate placement of your indenter and to indent in the correct direction. To position your scleral indenter, first ask the patient to look in the direction of gaze that's opposite the area that you want to indent. Then place the indenter in the skin crease and gently slide it backwards over the globe. Whilst holding it in place, ask the patient to switch their gaze back towards the indenter, enabling it to nestle into position. Once in place, you need to apply only gentle pressure on the sclera to indent it sufficiently to view the anterior retina up to the aura serrata. In this movie, we've covered the essential clinical optics, the instrument controls, and then the examination techniques for using the binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. As a result, we hope that you'll now have a better understanding of how the instrument works and be more confident in setting it up and adjusting the illumination and viewing systems. Finally, as with all clinical skills, indirect ophthalmoscopy can only be mastered by repeated and regular practice. Your efforts will be rewarded with superior three-dimensional views of the fundus that will transform your indirect ophthalmoscope from a piece of high-tech headgear into an indispensable clinical tool.